Gavin did everything in his power to keep the deck out of our hands, but he failed. And now that I stole his personal model, I can deliver the review he didn't want you to see. Except you've probably already seen a review by now. Or five. But I can still talk about emulators and how to set them up, okay? Well, I can show how to set my own personal texture project- God damn it! So every possible angle on this thing has already been covered. But the deck is a work in progress. Launch reviewers found it to be buggy and unpolished. Now that it's had months of updates, I can review a deck that's gotten its sea legs. I'll be testing the hardware itself, the experience of using it the way Valve wants you to, and then doing all the off-road emulator and modding stuff that makes the device really interesting. But I have a couple of rules. No emu deck and no windows. I wanted to push how close the default OS can get to the PC experience by keeping the setup as direct and manual as possible. This is the box I stole from Gabin's office. The deck comes with exactly what you need and nothing else. An AC adapter and a hard shell case. I've been surprised by how vital the case has turned out to be, since the system doesn't have a dock to rest in like the Switch does. I chose the 64GB model and before even powering it on it's clear how much better the hardware is than Switch for not much more money. The range and quality of inputs is excellent and the build is more solid. The Switch feels like a toy when picking it up now. I thought the Steam controller inputs felt janky, but the deck has that first party feel that Valve was missing last time, with buttons and bumpers that are snappier without feeling stiff. Everything from the Steam controller remains, and space has been made for the missing D-pad and right analog. The sticks are even capacitive now, so they can be used to activate motion like the trackpads. The back buttons have been doubled and they fall under my fingers perfectly. The shape allows them to be pressed either by squeezing the grips inward or by pushing your fingers outwards towards the center of the deck. The latter way takes some getting used to, but I find it doesn't disrupt my grip as much. With all of these new inputs, the deck is even more capable of absorbing keyboard schemes than the Steam controller was. It may look overpacked or cluttered, but your thumbs fall on a natural arc from one set of inputs to the next, so it's very comfortable to use. The exceptions are the track pads, which require your hands to shift outward. It's not uncomfortable to do this, but you won't be able to rest your palms on the contours while using them. It's basically the Steam Controller 2.0, and I would still love to get a standalone pad with these updates for PC. Valve mostly nailed it, but there are one or two compromises compared to the Steam Controller. The analog triggers are not dual stage and have no button at the end. Valve tried to retain the click through haptic feedback, but it's not very convincing. You can still map dual stage actions, they just won't feel as satisfying. The trackpads are also smaller and may require higher sensitivities than the Steam Pad to make up for the reduced range. They aren't quite as comfortable, but they get the job done, and Valve claims that they have lower latency than before. The trackpad click is also generated by haptics, with only a spongy give when the unit is off. It's way too sensitive by default and registers clicks when just swiping the surface, but the setting is fully adjustable. This is actually a big upgrade over the Steam Pads, which had a stiff popping quality that never felt right to me, because now you can dial in exactly how much pressure it takes for a button press and how strong the haptic click will be. Finding the settings to do that is a problem though, and this is the biggest disappointment I have with the deck. Steam input is a great feature, but the UI is in shambles here, with everything fragmented across nested menus. On PC, everything is clearly laid out on a controller graphic. Some of the advanced settings can be confusing, but the basics are very easy to find. The deck lets you view a layout like this, but not edit from it. Instead, you start with a quick setup screen that lists the button and stick groups in text. I think the idea is to present the simplest and most commonly changed inputs right away while tucking the more advanced stuff elsewhere but it doesn't really work because I find it less quick to read than the full menu with its navigation bar. The choice of quick settings is also strange. There are some very advanced options while the most basic things are omitted. The trackpad doesn't have an option for setting the click action, which is one of the key settings for the pad, so I end up having to go into the advanced menu every time when setting up anyway, meaning the quick menu is just an obstacle I have to click through to get to the real settings. It's also confusing to see settings displayed on the quick screen that can't be changed there. Lisa had a mode shift mapped to the grip that I wanted to remove, but none of the quick settings could disable it. It had to be removed from the advanced trackpad menu instead, which seems like another waste of the quick menu screen. Finding the click pressure sensitivity forced me to look up an answer online. Accessing the setting requires going from the quick start screen into the advanced menu, then the trackpad menu and clicking the gear next to the button action. I thought changing from soft press to regular press might fix it, but the actual way is to keep soft press on and enter the separate menu where the soft press threshold is kept. In desktop mode, most of this is on the same screen, and the tooltip descriptions guide you to the right option. Another oddity is that the desktop UI doesn't display the controls guide that PC does. I took a shot at it and pressed select anyway and found that it still opens the activators menu, which would be impossible to know if you weren't already intimately familiar with Steam on PC. 
The mapping selection now organizes input types into different tabs, with keyboard, number pad, and mouse split into separate screens rather than being visible at once, as they are on PC. There's also no toggle for multiple key bindings anymore. Instead, you have to map one key, then go to the gear next to the mapping and add a new command or subcommand, placing the second key there. I was most surprised to see how limited config sharing still is this far out from launch. The only options when viewing community layouts are download and select, and pushing select immediately applies the scheme without a chance to preview at first, like the desktop UI lets you do. I couldn't see a way to roll back to my previous scheme when this happened. The UI only lists standard templates or community configs, with no option for personal configs unless you've already manually exported one. No edits you do are saved otherwise. The download button doesn't seem to do anything other than prepare a config without applying it. I still couldn't find a way to preview it, so I don't see the point unless you plan to be without internet and want to grab a bunch of configs in advance to try later. I think you get the point by now that the new UI kind of sucks, at least when it comes to Steam input. It's filled with redundancies and makes things more complicated, slow, and difficult to find than the desktop UI. Valve has begun replacing Big Picture mode with it and I really hope they pump the brakes on that. The deck layout is great for browsing games, but in its current state it would be a major downgrade for Steam input. There's a lot to criticize here, but I've gotta stress that Steam input still works and is still a tremendous asset to the system. It's more of a pain to set up than it should be, but the end result is always worth it. You can create excellent control schemes that exceed what most gamepads are capable of offering, including the old Steam controller. Valve just needs to merge the labyrinthian submenus and tabs into something more efficient and like the desktop. The deck was built for playing modern Steam games and it's at its most polished here, but there were still some issues getting started. The system kept hanging for long periods during setup without any messages about what it was doing. The problem seemed to be that my Wi-Fi signal was too weak for the deck to finish updating. The wireless on the system is poor compared to the Switch, which itself is no prize, and I often don't get full bars when mere feet away from my router. This is apparently an issue with the chipset and drivers when using 5 GHz networks, which Valve has at least partially patched. Disabling a power saving feature in developer mode is supposed to be a further help, but I didn't see a big difference. I also couldn't find any sensible way to download games. The system cannot download in sleep mode, and either sleeping from the menu or tapping the power button will cause the internet to disconnect. I've just been dimming the screen and leaving it until the installs are finished. If there's a better way, I haven't found it. There were also some capacity issues. Granted I chose the lowest model, but it doesn't actually have 64 gigs to work with. After updating, the size of a clean drive was about 43 gigabytes. This rules out a lot of game installs, and even things that should fit can be problematic because of the caches and proton builds that download alongside them. Expect games to take up more space than they do on your PC. 20 gigabytes of my internal storage was claimed by other files. My non-Steam games were all on the SD and my Flatpak installs totaled 300 megabytes, so I used a program called FileLite to see where the mystery data was. Shader caches bloat over time and these are not deleted when uninstalling a title, which became an issue fast as I tested various games out. Within two weeks the cache had grown to 7 gigabytes. This phantom data can only be removed in desktop mode and there are tools that make this easy, but it does hurt the deck's image as a beginner-friendly system when it eventually requires you to fiddle with scripts in PC mode to do basic maintenance. The compat data folder houses all the fake Windows directories needed to make Proton work and it can't be erased without losing save data. It also blocks games from being moved sometimes, and the only real fix is to look up the game ID number on the store, then move its compat data from the SD onto the internal storage and try the transfer again. The phantom data can eat up whole drives if enough software is run, so Valve should really consider adding options to manage this. With all the bloat, anyone buying the 64GB model should consider it mandatory to get a micro SD with it. I still don't regret choosing it, because with a $30 card I was able to get more storage than the 256 model, for $100 less total. The main reason to buy the higher end models is the NVMe speed. I benched the internal flash at near 300 megabytes a second, which is in between a hard disk and SATA SSD. The SD card benched at under 100 megabytes a second. The NVMe models will bench much higher than this, but they usually don't show much improvement over the flash storage or SD in actual load times. Linux handles file I.O. a lot differently than Windows, and Steam OS seems especially optimized to get good load times even from the SD. It's possible that the speed advantage might matter once direct storage becomes standard, but there are still no big games with support to test, and it's also not clear how that will even work on Linux. The deck is much better suited to stuff from the PS4 and earlier than the current gen anyway, so I say the 64 model with a card is still the best value, but get the 256 version if you want to be extra safe. With all that out of the way, it's finally time to play a damn thing. Valve has produced their own title as a sort of pack-in game to get you used to the hardware, although they didn't actually pack it in. 
Aperture Desk Job is very well done for a free download, and it should be your first stop on the system, both for the tutorials and how surprisingly funny it is. Moving to my library, everything I attempted to install worked on the deck. I didn't try every game, but I tried an awful lot, including many titles that were not verified. About half my library fell into that category, and I never ran into a crash or buggy experience. The worst I found was a single broken FMV in Resident Evil 6, and that was patched while editing this video. Valve is pretty strict and will deny a verified rating for so much as some keyboard prompts showing up, so the games only marked playable are usually safe. What they've done with Proton is very impressive, and while your results may differ depending on your library, I found the Linux OS posed no issue for accessing my games. I did find that I didn't enjoy some games on the form factor as much as others. Intense games where you need clear visibility and awareness of your surroundings feel claustrophobic on the small screen, and competitive multiplayer also doesn't seem like a good idea. Adventure games, third-person shooters, and 2D titles are a great fit, though. The deck obliterates 7th generation games. You should be able to max any of these out and play at 60fps without a hitch. Their file sizes are also easy on the internal flash drive. 8th gen games are a little more demanding and require lowered settings, which makes sense since the deck is about on par with the PS4. When compared to my PC with the 3070, the visual quality obviously takes a hit, but it's really not bad for a handheld. The main compromise is that the resolution is lower, but that doesn't stand out much on the deck screen. One of the updates Valve has made since release is the refresh rate slider, which lets you choose to run games at 40 FPS instead of 60. This frame rate has become popular lately for being a great balance between visual quality and performance, and on the deck it has the benefit of saving battery life as well. Final Fantasy VII was struggling to hold 60 anyway, so 40 ended up feeling smoother despite the lower rate. It still had a lot of shader cache stuttering though. Resident Evil 2 gained enough performance headroom that I was able to increase the resolution from 720p to native, and raise a few effects while keeping a locked frame rate. There are specific games where you may want to push for 60, but in general 40 seems like the way to go when playing 8th gen ports. The experience of using the deck for normal Steam games is pretty smooth, and it's clear that this is what Valve has prioritized most so far. It's still not as seamless as a typical console, and there are some rough spots with downloading and data management. But as long as you stay on the trail and stick to verified titles, you'll have something that vaguely resembles a Switch Pro that plays PC games. But the deck is clearly not a Switch. This is mostly a one-way street where people just want a handheld PC and not a hybrid that can run on a TV. The people buying this probably already have a gaming rig for that. But docking could make this appealing as a portable PC that you could take to a friend's house, and it could be a godsend for broke college students who could use it as a work PC. Most of the emulator stuff I wanted to try requires using desktop mode, so I ordered a dock to make that process easier. Valve's official model was only just listed at $90, so for this review I used the JSOX dock that runs for $40. This company ripped off the style of Valve's dock prototype and beat them to release, although they don't provide DisplayPort and my model only has USB 2.0. It also seems to cover slightly more of the intake vents than the official dock. Plugging in at the top is clearly not as elegant as dropping the switch in its dock, but the deck would need a completely new design to get around that. Chris? It works pretty seamlessly when connected to a 1080p TV or my capture card, very much like using a docked switch. Take care. I had major slowdown problems when connecting to a 4K TV though. The games ran so slowly I could not even find out if this is Chris's blood. He's our old partner, you know. Desktop mode also had a lot of bugs. By default, the monitor will show up as a second screen. Cloning the deck screen to the monitor sometimes caused the desktop icons and taskbar to disappear on both devices until I unplugged the HDMI cable, and the times those elements did remain, the screen was very small. The solution was to set the monitor to 800p to match the deck resolution. These faults come from the deck, not the dock, and as I was making the video, Valve released an update that addressed most of them. 4K TV output is indeed fixed now. I included those bugs anyway to show how rapidly things are still changing on the system. Day to day, fundamental features are still getting overhauled. It seems Valve couldn't afford to focus on docked mode until approaching the release of their own product, so now all of the support is coming at once. Controllers have a lot of remaining connectivity issues. Before my dock arrived, I tried Steam Link to stream to a TV while playing with two gamepads, and the result was choppy video and dropped inputs. Even when docked and using HDMI, I couldn't keep a Switch Pro connected for longer than 20 seconds. It works when playing solo, but with two controllers active it was completely unstable. Unlike a Windows PC, the Pro wasn't recognized when connecting it to the dock with USB, and I know it connected because it started charging, so wired play didn't work either. A Series X controller stayed connected but kept rumbling long after the triggering events had stopped. The DualSense was the only first party option that played nice with the deck. 
A Wii U Pro with a Mayflash adapter did work, but it was recognized as the Tribute 64, a gamepad I reviewed last year. I'm not sure what crossed wire led to that label appearing on the deck, but at least it worked without any problems. There's still a lot wrong with controller support, so hopefully Valve addresses that as part of the dock updates. If you plan to use desktop mode heavily, then you pretty much need to get a dock or hub to connect a keyboard and mouse. The deck controls are workable enough, but they only function when Steam is online. Failing to connect will leave all inputs dead aside from the touchscreen, which is a treat. The connection issues I had made this a frequent problem, and even when I had online access, the Steam servers could go down and kill the controls. Even though I had mapped keyboard and mouse bindings, they often failed to work when launching software in desktop mode. The deck's system level hotkeys could also fail to respond, which made it tricky to exit full screen games. In some cases, I was able to force focus back to the desktop by trying to open the keyboard overlay, but in others, I had to physically connect a real keyboard to use the escape key. If you don't have USB hardware handy, you can easily get trapped in a game. The Linux OS also requires using a hotkey combo of shift and delete to get rid of large files. Valve's on-screen keyboard cuts the delete key off, so without a real board you'd have to make a custom mapping for the delete key on the deck somewhere. The desktop config menu isn't ideal to work with since it doesn't show all the inputs the deck has. I could only find settings for the right trackpad, for instance. The left pad double-clicked way too easily and blasted through menus as I opened them, and I have no idea how to change that. The last system update addressed this, but it's still happening. So heed this warning and save yourself a lot of trouble by connecting a keyboard before meddling with the desktop. Once you're set up for it, the Plasma interface is actually not too bad to navigate. As a Windows user, it's definitely more natural and familiar than a Mac, and the process of installing new software is mostly easy. And by software, I mean emulate. There's a certain company out there that takes down videos of their games running on deck, whether they have the right to or not. Just as a refresher, emulation is legal, with precedent for that going back decades. I am not encouraging anyone to pirate and have always advocated for dumping legally purchased games, which is how I got the majority of titles I'll be showing here, and I've got the receipts to prove it. The only exceptions are games that aren't available for sale, in which case, I stole them. Okay, I did it. And if any company has a problem with that, they can make things square by putting those games up for sale. I want to pay. I have the money here, on the table. If you want to take my money off the table, sell your game. Anyway, once you've gotten used to the desktop quirks, it's actually very easy to install emulators on the deck. Most developers are Linux stands, so almost every major project is on Flathub. All you have to do is open the built-in Discovery app, search for your emulator, and the odds are high that you'll find it. You can even find specific forks here, like Primehack. I didn't know what I was doing when starting out and went to Flathub directly to get the emulators, which just caused Discovery to open and download them anyway, so don't do that, just go to Discovery. After installing an emulator, you should launch it at least once to make sure all the directories are created. Within five minutes, you can have everything you need installed on your deck, and Discovery also makes it really easy to keep the software up to date. Simu was the only platform I wanted to try that wasn't on Flathub yet, but the install process is still pretty easy. You just have to download the Windows version, then add the EXE as a non-Steam game and open its properties. Setting the compatibility mode to use the newest Proton version should get it to run. I only had the disk space to test Wind Waker HD, but it seemed to work smoothly. I was pleasantly surprised to see that installing emulators is actually easier on deck than Windows, but the hard part is transferring your files over. You'll not only want to move your ROMs, but also the system files and keys that some emulators require you to dump. This is where Linux really diverges from Windows. The deck SD card format can't be read by Windows, so you can't just drop your ROMs on it and put it in the deck. Files have to be transferred with a USB drive or over the internet using custom software. USB is simple and direct if you have a dock. One thing to note is that the OS gives you the choice of moving the files or copying them. Moving deletes the files from the USB when it's done, and this causes error messages when connecting the stick to PC again. It's best to choose copy, then erase the drive on Windows later. The main obstacle will be finding the paths for your emulator installations. They aren't listed in an obvious place, and the browse buttons in the emulator settings or Steam itself won't open folders or respond at all. The answer is that all flat packs go into a hidden folder in the home directory called var, which you can't see until enabling hidden items. After finding this folder, the directories within are usually structured as they are on Windows, and you can drag your files right in. Something to note is that capitalization matters on Linux, and if the folders aren't named with the exact same case, they'll be recognized as separate paths. Oh shit. Another challenge is setting the path to games on the SD card. Unlike Windows, the card won't show up as something simple like Drive D, and instead has a convoluted address that's several folders deep in the run directory. Some software can access this folder directly, but others won't display it up front. 
You may have to start from the run folder and work your way to the card, or paste the address into the bar. In the case of BSNES, I couldn't get the emulator to recognize the card at all, so I gave up and moved my ROMs to the internal storage. Yes, EmuDeck makes all of this simpler, but I wanted to suffer the full deck experience. The next step is to add your games to Steam as non-Steam games. That way you can boot them in the normal deck mode. I found that entries for my Windows emulators showed up alongside the deck ones, so I created a new category to separate them. Your titles will display as blank slabs by default, so you'll probably want to add artwork for them. It's easy to find posters online or to just make a custom PNG yourself, but adding them to Steam is another step that could have been made much more intuitive. I began by adding art in the properties menu on my library list, but that does pretty much nothing. You have to instead click on your category, then right click on the blank posters in the main window to find the real setting. It would be easier if the icon and poster art weren't in two different places, Gabin! The final step is to configure the emulators, and you should try to do as much of this in desktop mode as you can. Sometimes windows won't display correctly in deck mode, or your cursor won't reach the buttons and you have to force them to close from the Steam menu. Other times the windows do display correctly in deck mode, but won't on the desktop. You have to figure it out for each individual emulator, sometimes switching back and forth to get it done. This part of the process sucks, but it only has to be done once. You'll also need to use Steam input to set mouse and click actions to boot the games. The trackpads make this easy when playing handheld, but if you intend to use a controller it may be harder to map. The DualSense touchpad is a great solution for this. Otherwise your controls map as a normal gamepad by default, which makes setup easy for most systems. Once finished, you should be able to browse your emulators from deck mode and play them as easily as a Steam game. The deck is pretty capable as an emulation machine, and most systems run well at 720p. Primehack is more demanding and has some stuttering during heavy action, but Dolphin mostly runs at full speed. I was really fond of how the Steam controller worked for Metroid, and the deck is even better. The extra back buttons make it easier to map the waggle actions, and the visors and beams can now be mapped to the D-pad and right stick, as they were on the GameCube. The D-pad is also excellent for side-scrollers. I never would have trusted the Steam controller's trackpad for games like this, but the deck D-pad is more reliable than Nintendo's recent ones. Citra and Simu have touchscreens that are difficult to manage with most controllers, but the deck screen and trackpads make it easy to work around. In the case of Citra, you either have to find a size balance that you're comfortable with, or set a hotkey to swap the screens as needed. Simu also allows you to toggle with a hotkey, or hold a key to temporarily view the touchscreen. That's all well and good, but if you have a dock, you can emulate the full dual screen experience. It requires that your monitor is set up as a second screen and correctly aligned with the deck's window. In Simu, you just have to set the gamepad view to show up as a separate window, then drag the main window over to your monitor. After maximizing both windows, you will have a fully functional Wii U gamepad in your hands. Or sitting in your dock, anyway. Holding the pad in your lap would require a longer cable. Citra should be capable of doing the same, but it's not quite as simple and I couldn't get it to work. The windows can't be separated, and the config file needs to be edited to lock the sizes and resolutions in place. I followed a guide and copied their config data, but it led to the screens being reversed, and the swap screens hotkey no longer functioned. It may have been possible to fix this by rearranging my screens in the deck settings, but between the config editing and losing hotkey support, I felt like it was more trouble than it was worth. Hopefully the Citra developers have enough interest to make deck support an inbuilt feature that can be set with a simple click. Motion control was also a failure. SDL doesn't recognize the deck's IMU, so a server has to be set up for emulators to access it. I ran a script to do this, but the current Simu versions didn't recognize it. I think the script is meant for older Simu versions that still work with Simu Hook, and being locked to an older build was a deal breaker for me. Citra also couldn't seem to hear anything from the deck's port. This is one of the things that Emu Deck mostly automates, so while I typically dislike hubs and organizers like this, it might be worth using if you really want gyro support. The Linux file system causes some headaches, but getting emulators to run on the deck is pretty manageable. A beginner may want to rely on Emu Deck, but anyone with emulation experience will be able to handle it on their own. Mods are a big part of gaming on Steam, and if the deck weren't able to support them it wouldn't be a true PC. I decided to start small with my own texture mods, because if I can't get those running I shouldn't expect anyone else to. Citra made this easy. All mods and textures are housed in the user directory, so everything was already copied over when I first transferred my system files. Leo's project restoration mod loaded right up on its own, and I just had to tick a settings box to get the textures to load. Dolphin was just as simple. Copying my PC directory over brought all my saves and textures at once. Ishii Ruka's material maps are broken on Linux, but the base textures work as expected. N64 was slightly more complicated. Rosalie's Moopin with GUI is the only option on Flathub with HD texture support. It's still experimental, but it's easy to configure and works pretty well. 
All I had to do was copy the HDS cache to the right directory. The full 20GB size was a bit much for DEC, so I used a compressed 7GB cache. The folder structure on this one is different than Windows, so I had to check the settings for the default path. Once placed there, the textures worked fine. Modding the ROM required a PC, since the patcher utility is designed around Windows PowerShell. After applying the mods, it's simple to put the game on a USB, then move it to the deck. This enables you to get things like the Redux mod, which puts the masks in Ocarina on the D-pad. You can also have the instrument icons change along with Link's forms now, or create the elegy statues with a button combo. You can even do 30 frames per second if you're willing to toggle the mod on and off to get around certain glitches. Texture packs are a piece of cake on the deck, and the 16GB of RAM should accommodate any of them. Modding Steam games is much tougher, and the results were mixed. I started with a simple mod to remove the input change notifications in Resident Evil 6. The folder structure is the same as on PC, so I just had to find the Steam folder by browsing the local files, and from there it was a simple drag and drop. The mod was successful, and now I can play this trash to my heart's content. Next, I tried to go big by finding the dumbest, least horny mod on Nexus. Modding RE Engine games is usually done through a manager, so I downloaded it on deck and tried to get it to run with Proton. It struggled with the file system, but I found my game directory under Drive Z. From there, the mod appeared to install successfully, but nothing changed when loading it up. I next tried to manually move the files over, but the folder structure didn't match. I installed the beta DX11 version of the game for better performance, and it seems to be packed differently than the original release was. So I wasn't able to access any of the files, but it does explain why Mod Manager failed. Others have reported that it does work, so it may depend on the folders being laid out as expected. I also tried Vortex Mod Manager, which the devs only support on deck with a Lutra script. More on that later. It failed several times before I saw that the method was broken and the developer had abandoned it. Finally, I tried the Resident Evil 4 HD project. The creators have posted a guide to using their installer on deck, but the EXE requires downloading all files anew in bin format. I had the 1.0 release and update patches on my PC still, so I tried to transfer them over manually instead. This initially gave me a lot of trouble and the software crashed whenever starting a game or loading a file. The old installation guide was removed when switching to the new installer method, so I had forgotten that you have to delete the original Bio4 folder, not overwrite it. After deleting and moving the files in again, it worked. The game takes up 40 gigabytes now, but it's well worth it. I didn't cast a very wide net, and for some reason only tested Resident Evil, but it seems like any mod that can be done with simple file overwrites will work on the deck. Mods that require special loaders or injectors are at the very least going to need workarounds, and may still likely fail. I saved the biggest challenge for last, getting old Direct3D 8 games to run. There were a lot of conflicting guides for Silent Hill 2 Enhanced Edition, and the first was dead-ended by broken software that failed to load. Proton Tricks is the deck version of Wine Tricks from Linux PCs, helping install games with compatibility fixes. It completely failed to launch, with most commenters reporting the same, so it seems to have been busted for a while. I then copied the raw game files over and ran the project installer through Steam's Proton layer. This also required navigating to the Z drive. To my relief, the rest of the installation finished smoothly, I just had to relink the Steam entry to point to the game EXE rather than the installer, keeping the Proton compatibility on, and from there the game was fully playable. So far, so good. I tried Dino Crisis Rebirth next. The game fails with Proton but it has a Lutris install script available. Lutris is vaguely similar to Proton and Wine in that it installs Windows software on Linux. Lutris just recently showed up on Flathub with deck support, so this was a good chance to try it out. It wasn't clear how to begin, but after finding the search option I pulled up the Dino Crisis script pretty quickly. I needed to set up a new directory to install the files into, and after that the script ran for a few seconds before failing to link to GitHub. Obviously that's not supposed to happen. It's an outdated certificate problem that pops up a lot with Lutris. I tried again the next day and found that the interface had changed for no reason. There was no longer any access to the SD card and the button stopped responding. Later, the interface had returned to normal, but the script still couldn't link with GitHub. I tried modifying the script with the argument suggested in the error message and then loaded that file. It seemed to get past the download stage, but failed to find the ddraw file for the mod, despite it being linked in an earlier step. Maybe it will improve in the future, but my first impression of Lutris was that it was a buggy mess and a waste of time. But that was just one game! It made sense to try Silent Hill 3 after 2 installed so easily, but the install process is much different this time, relying again on Lutris. I downloaded a script and put the necessary files on a USB, then ran the installer. The setup was pretty simple, but the process hung on the last step, which is necessary for the audio fixes to work. 
The recourse for this, run reloaded through Lutris Wine, wasn't exactly instructive to a beginner, so I fell back on the other option of doing the whole thing over from scratch. It hung for an hour and a half this time before I pulled the plug. I gave Metal Gear Solid 2 a shot along with V's fix. This is the GOG version with some enhancements modded in. The game also failed using Proton, giving a D3D object error. Apparently, the game can be installed using Wine Tricks, but I wasn't able to find much information about how to actually do that, and Proton Tricks was still busted. I tried a Direct 3D 8 to 9 file swap and added an override to Steam's launch options. The game failed with the same D3D object error. I noticed that I got the same message on my PC depending on the resolution set in the VSFIX menu, so I tried different resolutions and aspect ratios on deck, but to no avail. There were no scripts for the game on Lutris, but after some digging I did find one on the Vs mod GitHub. After running it, it took off and began installing file after file. I was getting closer now. The tension was terrible. The fate of the planet may hang in the balance. Fifteen minutes of downloads completing, files extracting, bits and bytes flying. It was almost clear, and it crashed with the same fucking message. So, fuck it. I hate Lutris and its stupid face. If you can't emulate a console port, use that and don't even think about the Windows version. Silent Hill 2 seemed to be an outlier where installing was worth the effort. The time wasted on the others turned me off of trying anything else. You can play new games and emulate the very old ones, but the deck is not well suited to the 2000s era stuff in between. My overall opinion of the deck is that it's a great piece of hardware with incredible potential, but that it's also a frustrating and buggy pain to set up. So, a pretty faithful port of the PC experience to a handheld, in other words. Valve got the hardware right, which is the important part. The software can be changed. And there's no doubt that they're committed to the device and will get it there eventually. But seven months out, it's still very much in a beta phase, where major changes are still happening on a weekly basis. If I had to guess, I'd say that the system won't really be stable for at least another seven months. So if you've been trying unsuccessfully to get a deck for a while, don't feel too bad about it. You're better off for the wait. Most of the third-party stuff I was hoping to see is also still hypothetical. Developers may start supporting deck natively. Lutris and Proton Tricks may get fixed and expand game compatibility. New mod injectors built for the deck may appear, but that stuff also isn't here yet. Time may have passed, but availability remained poor. Developers can't be expected to build for the deck until they have one. So if you just want the deck to play a few Steam games, don't hesitate to dive in now. It's already a great platform for that. If you plan to heavily use it docked, like a Switch, maybe wait a few more months so that Valve can iron out the issues that will come under their radar now that the dock is shipping. If you want to use it as an emulation machine, it works well, but you have to be prepared for slightly complicated setups. Even if you rely on Emu Deck, it can't fix everything that's quirky about Steam input and desktop mode right now. If you like to heavily mod your games and want to bring every PC enhancement over to the deck, you're likely in for disappointment and will have to give up a few tweaks. And if you want to play a lot of non-Steam games, especially old ones, it's practically a dead end unless you're a Linux wizard and can write your own scripts. That was my experience at least. But I do like the Steam Deck a lot. The tone of this video may have skewed negative because I was probing the system to find its limits and weaknesses. The fact that I found some doesn't mean that the system is bad, just that hey, this is where the line is and if you go past it things get rocky fast. Most users will never run into these issues. And even if some parts of it are a mess, the deck is still a kind of triumph. Valve's past failures gave them unique advantages when designing it. The Linux OS they created for the Steam machines and the inputs of the Steam controller formed the foundation of it. They finally found a successful vehicle for all the research and innovation they've done over the past decade. Solving every problem might take a new platform with more customized hardware, but the launch deck is already the most fully featured handheld ever made. If you're brave, buy one. Get pissed off. Get a headache. Lie down for a minute while the errors accumulate. And then enjoy the bliss of seeing the fucking thing actually work somehow, finally. And what do you know? It's really fun. And when you accidentally breathe the exhaust fumes, you might even see Gabin watching over you. And know that the shortages were just tests of faith. That he always wanted you to have a deck in the end. And that the mystery data was Half-Life 3 all along. And eternal gaming shall be your reward. Amen.